I'm happy to be a part of this church. And so today is one of those opportunities when uh, I get to do like a State of the Union address or something like that. It's the day of our congregational meeting, and if we're not in the midst of a sermon series, every so often I like to cast vision for the church. That's in some ways part of my role as a pastor is to give us vision for the future, to remind us why we're here and what we're doing and where we're going and what God might have in store for us. And that's what I want to do today from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll give you a minute to get there, but it will not be on the screen. We're going to stay in that chapter the whole time. So you can turn in your Bibles now if you have them uh, or any kind of device with a Bible app. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll read the text out loud, but I'd love for you to have it in front of you. Also, if you're taking notes, I'll have three points this morning. And this this won't be an especially short sermon, but it shouldn't be too long either. It should be just right, I think. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Apostle Paul in this letter to the church in Corinth. It's my prayer that you would speak through Paul's pen and through me here in this pulpit to your people, that we would be enlivened to carry out your mission in this church and in the world around us. Inspire us to do more for your kingdom. Convict us when we fall short, but remind us of your continued mercy and your patience. We appreciate your forgiveness, and we really appreciate all of our undeserved blessings. As a congregation, we want to serve you well, so I pray that this sermon would be a catalyst for effective change, for growth, for your kingdom purpose. Work through us and around us and beyond us. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read 17 verses. But I, meaning the Apostle Paul speaking here, but I, brothers and sisters, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Even now you're not ready. You're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple, that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a wonderful text that many of us have heard read or preached before. This morning, I want to take that text and pull out three points, but before we get there, I want to tell you a quick story. So, when I was fresh out of college, newly married, Uh, pastoring a church for the first time in Tennessee, I decided to go into an online master's program for seminary. And the first class I was required to take was research methods. And I, to be honest with you, I had written hundreds of pages by this point from all the different classes I had taken in high school and college and three or four books I started to write and never finished while I was in college. Uh, I, I like to write and, and to read, and I 
fancy myself a pretty good writer. And so I didn't take the class very seriously, is what I'm trying to tell you. It was an online class. There were only like a dozen of us in the program in that class. And almost half the grade was the final paper. It was like 25 to 30 page research paper, two or three sources per page, something like that. It was all about research methods. So I spent a lot of hours in the library and on internet databases and sourcing all these different things in my paper. And to be honest with you, I cut some corners, but I knew the paper read well. I read it from front to back, and I thought, this is a good paper, so I turned it in. That is the only C I think I've ever received in my whole life. And I was mad. (laughs) So I, I emailed the professor. I paced and panicked for about five minutes, and then I called the professor, and I said, you got to tell me what's going on here. Uh, Why do I have a C on this paper? And he said, I'll send you my grading rubric, and I'll let you look at the notes. So he emailed me that PDF. I opened it up, and it said, paper equals 95 to 100 A. Sourcing slash resources, something like that, equals F. And so I called him again, and I said, what does this mean? And he said, go back and look through the footnotes in your paper, in your bibliography. Sure enough, the paper had maybe a missing comma here or there, and and on the whole, it was a good paper, but my resources were poor. I didn't just choose a couple of bad ones off the internet, but I didn't didn't cite them properly. There's this real strict, it's called SBL2, uh, Scholastic Biblical Literature Handbook Second Edition, something like that. In seminary, it's what you have to use to format your footnotes and your bibliography. I didn't buy that book because it was like $35, and I said, I'm just going to use MLA or APA or something like that. It would be fine. Well, I ended up using a mixture of those, and none of that was acceptable. So every one of my footnotes had red lines through it. My bibliography had red lines all through it. And because it was a research methods class, and that was the main point of the class, I basically, I should have failed that paper. So I found out not only did he give me a C, but he was being gracious. And again, I was frustrated. So I talked to him about it, and he said, the reason I gave you a C is to remind you of the importance of the foundation of your work. You're entering a program in seminary. You're ministering to people in a church Your foundation matters. Your research matters. You can't just write good papers or preach good sermons if there's no foundation, if you don't know where your sources come from, if if you don't document things well. And he basically explained to me something that my dad had already taught me for years. Foundations and footers are important. You can't build well if you don't have a solid foundation. The same is true in scholasticism. The same is true in our Christian faith. Paul uses this beautiful analogy of buildings. And he says, I'm a master builder. I, you know, I'm a general contractor, and I might subcontract out some of this work. God might use me to, to frame it up and Apollos to hang the drywall and some of you to paint and decorate. But at the end of the day, we all work together on the house, and the foundation is Jesus Christ. And he uses this analogy to challenge the believers to work hard because their work matters. And so that leads to my three points this morning. I'll tell you all three of them right away. First of all, our work matters. In fact, I have these on a slide if you want to put it up here. Our work matters. Our work will be evaluated. And finally, our work is a shared labor. We do it together. So I want to talk about these three things. And I want this sermon to be a catalyst for the next year, at least until next year's congregational meeting, to be a reminder and an encouragement of what we're trying to achieve here as a congregation. We are doing work together. And if this last year has taught me anything, it's that I value the people I work with in the church, you. I value you. And preaching sermons on a camera and not being around people is is very isolating. And and it helped me realize there's just so much that has to be done. And until we get our hands dirty, it it won't get done. And God has called us to do it. So I'm going to talk about that. First, our work matters. And I have some verses pointed out here. Verses 1 through 3, let's look at that together. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. Paul says, But I, brothers and sisters, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Even now you're not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. 
So Paul uses the the word in the Greek for characterized by instead of made up of. So earlier in 1 Corinthians, he said that we are of the flesh, meaning in the Greek, it's a different word, different ending. Last few letters are different, and it means we're made of flesh. Yes, we are made of flesh, but here he accuses the church not only of being made of flesh, but still acting like their flesh. They should have been made alive in the Holy Spirit, but they still live like they're in their worldly flesh. Some people call it carnal Christianity or um, backslidden Christianity. or the, People use different phrases, but all it means is that they're not serious about the work of the Lord. They've believed in Jesus. They, they have received God's gift, but they're not doing anything about it. And so he's warning them, if you receive the gift of God's grace, if you take Jesus at face value, but then you don't do his work, you're wasting a lot of gifts. You're wasting a lot of, of time when you could be building. And that's what he's going to spend the rest of this chapter talking about. So he says in these first few verses, you are still babes. You're not ready to work. Now I'll tell you why that matters. Look at verse 9 through verse 11. He says, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he's always clear. You can't build anything for God if you don't build it upon Jesus. Anything else you do, whether it's for yourself or for God, it means nothing if it's not built on the foundation of Jesus. But that's the message we've all heard a hundred times. What I think is important here is to recognize he calls us God's fellow workers. And he doesn't just mean he and Apollos. He means all of those who minister for Christ, all of those who follow Jesus are God's fellow workers. The reason that is so significant is because he just told us we're still babes and we haven't grown up. In the ancient world, and and still today for some families, when kids get old enough, they pick up their parents' trade. They help around with, with the business. In the ancient world, it was pretty much always that way. Let's say your father was a fisherman. Well, eventually you need to learn how to fish. As soon as you're old enough, you're out on the boat, you're helping your dad, you're helping bring in money for your family. If he was a carpenter, you'd be helping him frame up walls and and lay stone or whatever it looked like in the ancient Near East. You would help your parents as soon as you were at a working age. Today, we still have a similar mindset that when you're able to work, you should start doing things. Even my five-year-old helps clean up around the house and and put things away. And every year she gets older, she's able to do a little bit more to help out. But what if she was still drinking milk like a baby? Like some Christians are still drinking milk like infants. Well, they can't be God's fellow workers if they're still untrained, unskilled babies. Do you see the problem? For Paul, that's the disconnect. Some of you are still babies drinking milk, and I've got all this work for you to do. God has all these plans, and you can't even get started because you're still infants. Grow up so you can get to work. And so the first thing we have to understand is we can't do the work until we are prepared to do the work. And that means building on the right foundation and getting all the soft clay and dirt and junk out of the way so that we can set on the rock what we need to set. So Paul begins by saying, you got to grow up. You got to move past the elementary junk, get ready to do the real thing. Hebrews 6 talks about that as well, about moving beyond the elementary things, the repetition every week, hearing the same stuff over and over again. It's time to move beyond that and get your hands dirty. The phrase we're going to use and keep using throughout this year is it's time to participate and not just observe. Participation as opposed to observation. Lots of Christians today are very happy to observe the kingdom of God, to show up week after week and sing along to words on a screen and maybe put money in an offering basket and and support their preacher and good things. They do good things, drop their kids off at church functions. But all of that is, is still very much observation until you get your hands dirty, until you start to serve, not just in the local church, But let this be your preparation place to go out and serve the Lord in your life, in your workplace, with your family, with your friends, with your own family at home. I mean your extended family, but also your immediate family in the house. There are all these people in your life you can minister to, all of these ways in which you could serve God, but many people never get their hands dirty. They never do the work. They're not God's fellow workers. They're still babies drinking the milk. That's what this is. 
week after week. It's, it's milk and occasionally some solid food, but it's a lot of milk until you take it and do something with it. That's when it becomes meat, when you take the milk and you go to work. It's hard to explain that, and that analogy doesn't fit great for what I'm trying to say. But I think the fellow worker does. A child who's still that small cannot work well with his father or with her father. God has called you to work with him. And then he says, you are God's field, God's building. Two analogies. One, the planting and the watering and the growing of the crops, but all the crops belong to God. So even when Paul does great and Apollos does great, all the glory goes to God. It's his harvest. We're part of his good harvest. That's a beautiful analogy. But buildings are another good analogy. God has assigned contractors. In this case, the apostles and people like Apollos who come in and and follow up and and do more work. But then he subcontracts out a lot of the jobs. There's a trim guy and a painter and someone hanging gutters on the roof. There's people doing all these different jobs sort of subcontracted out, but they all matter. Every job is important for the building of the house. In the same way that if you wanted a house built and all they did was frame up the walls and they did a really good job and they put on a roof and then they left the job and said, go ahead, move into your house, you would not be happy. You want siding on the outside. You want drywall, not just hung, but finished and painted. You want light fixtures. You want furniture. You want probably crown molding or trim and baseboards. You, you want your house done, completed, and beautiful. In the same way, God's work is meaningful because every person brings something that adds import or beauty. Every person has meaningful work in the kingdom of God. We, we dote on the people like myself who stand up front and I guess you might say are framing up the walls or something, putting the big sturdy pieces together and saying, this is the important stuff. Keep, keep all this in mind. Keep it right. Keep it plumb and level and straight. But that doesn't make a beautiful house. It's what all of you do all week long that makes the house beautiful. The part I do is often what nobody ever sees outside of these walls. What you do is what everybody will see you, the church. And so the leadership have, have pushed and pushed the last few weeks in our conversations to try, to try to figure out a way to encourage you to participate and not just observe because the work is important. Our work matters, our work, and it is a group effort. When Paul says here, for you are God's field, God's building, and elsewhere when he says you, 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 he's using the plural, the collective pronouns for our and you and us. He's he's saying all of these things in the plural, as opposed to Romans 12. It says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't you know you are a temple of the Lord? That passage is a singular you, just you. Each of you has a temple, and he's talking about sexual immorality. Keep your bodies pure because you are a temple. Here, he's talking about the church. You all are the building of God. So we each are temples for the Holy Spirit, but collectively we are the temple of God, and it works in both ways. So he goes on in verse 10 and 11, talks about how he laid this foundation of Jesus Christ. That's what the apostles did. They laid the foundation, but now every generation of believers is building the house, finishing and decorating and making it beautiful, the house in which God himself will live. It matters. It matters. And then verse 16 Do you not know that you are God's temple, that God's spirit dwells in you? If you are building the place in which the spirit of God will dwell, that is important work. Some of you this morning still don't feel like you offer anything important to the kingdom of God. Some of you don't feel like you offer much to the world in general, but especially in the church. What am I supposed to do? That's why so many observe rather than participate, because they don't know what they have to offer. Let this year be a period of exploration where you try things and sign up and volunteer and get involved and talk to your neighbors and talk to your coworkers and have conversations you've been afraid to have. Do something, because your work matters. What you do matters. And I should say our work matters. Because as we'll see in a moment, we do it together. Second point, our work will be evaluated. Let's look at verses 12 to 15. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, and then the other option, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. That is, if you build with good quality materials... When the day discloses it, that is the final day of judgment before Christ, on that day it will be known that you did the good, the good things, the right things, that you had the right motives, that you were trying to honor God. But if you build with wood, straight, wood, straw, and hay, 
it will also be disclosed that you cut corners, that you didn't really try, or that you didn't give it your effort like you ought to have. All of that will be disclosed. It will become manifest. That phrase just means it will be made plain. What you think might be hidden from others or what you don't think people have really watched or paid attention to, the work you do for God day in and day out, though you don't think anybody cares, you will be held accountable. God will judge even his believers for the work that they've done. And it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. I don't think that literally means you're going to stand in fire on Judgment Day. It's a figure of speech, meaning like a house that burns, what remains? You see it all over this county, houses and, and cabins that have burned up over the years. What's still standing almost always? Chimney, right? Yeah, maybe a foundation, stones, and a chimney. It's the, the precious stones, the, the good stuff that stays. But all the wood, all the hay and straw, as they call it in the Bible, all that stuff burns up. That's what's being described here. At the final judgment, when the day, capital D, discloses it, it will be made plain whether you were building with quality materials or whether you were cutting corners and trying to save yourself. It's not meant to scare you, though, because Paul goes on to say that if the work anyone has built on the foundation survives. Again, it has to be on the foundation of Christ. But if it survives, you will receive a reward. So we're not talking about if it survives and you're going to get into heaven. What he means is when the kingdom comes, when that day is disclosed and, and everything's made manifest, you will receive rewards for all of your good labor. Anything you did for God that was of eternal significance, it will last and you will be pleased to see it and God will reward you for it. But then he says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Not loss of salvation, not separation from God forever, but rather he says, though he himself will be saved only as through fire. So again, this isn't to scare you and think you're going to go to hell if you don't do enough good works. What it means is you will not have the capacity to appreciate God's coming kingdom if you don't begin to build it now in this world. When his kingdom finally comes, you won't be able to, to receive it quite as well as those who have been laboring with the good things. I hope that makes sense. So God is trying to warn you, not that you're going to be cast off forever, but that when he comes back, if you've worked hard, you will be prepared to receive greater blessing. And those who have slacked off and cut corners, those who have left the work for others to do, they'll have little to show to God and they'll have little reward from God. They will still be in his kingdom. They just won't have the same kind of rewards or appreciation. That's the warning. Some Christians don't like to hear that, but I think it's, it's an incentive. God knows how humans work. It's the same reason we give raises and promotions at jobs. It's the same reason we discipline our children or give them special treats. We need incentives, at least this side of heaven, and God is incentivizing kingdom work. If you do my work, it's not just because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to bless you for it. When that day comes, I'll give you more than what you thought possible. This is good news, and it's because we're building God's house. And then verse 17, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. So again, he reminds us how important the work is. And because it's so important, if you tear it down or you do something to disrupt that, that productivity in the kingdom, God will have to tear you down. Again, it doesn't mean you'll be cast out of his kingdom. It just means he's going to have to get you out of the way. There are a lot of churches who have closed their doors over the last 2,000 years. Some have opened, but many have closed. Often because they're not really doing God's work. And because they're not doing God's work, God moves them out of the way so that others can do the work. Again, this isn't about your individual salvation, but it is about the purpose and the work of the church. And you are part of the church. Every last one of you who is here today, you are part of Christ's body, part of his church. There's work to do, and that work will be evaluated. We don't want to be the subcontractor who never shows up and holds up progress on the entire build. Some of you, how many of you had houses built? or renovations done, significant renovations. Probably a lot of you, right? I bet every last one of you has dealt with people not showing up when they said they would, not getting the materials that they said they were going to get, or their employees not showing up and not being able to get it done quick enough, and then there's delays, right? You get delays, things cost more than you expected, and some of you know how frustrating that can be as homeowners. Imagine God's frustration 
when so many in the church hold up progress and delay what is inevitable in his kingdom. He'll get it done. The question is, will you be a part of it? Our work will be evaluated. And finally, our work is shared labor. Before we get to that, I have a couple of quotes I want to read to you. And these will be on the screen. I try to make them bigger between services because they were hard to read before. You probably still can't read it, but I'll read it to you. Oswald Chambers wrote in Bringing Sons into Glory and Making All Things New, spiritual maturity... Because that's really, that's what we're talking about, right? Growing from infancy into fellow workers of God, grown Christians who are able to, to contribute and participate. That kind of maturity in Christ is not reached by the passing of the years. It's not over time, meaning you could be in this pew for 10 more years and be exactly where you are in your spiritual maturity. Sadly, that's exactly what some of you have probably done. 10 years ago, you weren't much different than you are today when it comes to your spiritual maturity. Some of you have grown leaps and bounds, and I praise God for it. So it's not because the years go by, but by obedience to the will of God. It's by getting your hands dirty. It's not just by listening to good sermons or praising God to good music. It's by doing God's work, the kind of work that got Jesus crucified. Some people mature into an understanding of God's will more quickly than others because they obey more readily. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. They more readily sacrifice the life of nature to the will of God, meaning they leave behind the life of the flesh in order to pursue the things of God. That's what Paul's writing about in 1 Corinthians 3. And then James, which is technically the name Jacob, and we believe half-brother of Jesus, he wrote these words in the Bible. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James says, if you will do what Christ commanded, not just listen to it again and again, but get active, do something about it, participate, quit observing and participate, you will be blessed in your doing. He doesn't say, if you keep just listening, you'll lose out on salvation. That's not what's at stake here. What's at stake is reward in the coming kingdom and good fruit for the kingdom of God. You're, you're risking making God's house less beautiful by not doing your part. That's what you're risking. And if you really love God, then you want to make his house beautiful, which means you've got to use every gift you have and contribute, participate. Don't just observe. And to do that means it is a work we share. Our work. As those who represent Christ to the world, we all have gifts to use or waste. Those gifts are significant because they work together. I would like to make two points about this. First of all, that sometimes we need people to hold us accountable. So when I say this is a shared work, Paul talks about himself and Apollos and anybody else who's going to build. He's, ob he's obviously saying this is a group effort and none of us get credit. It's God who gets the credit. We'll get to that in a moment. But, but first, we need to admit that sometimes when God's trying to get the soft clay and dirt out of the way to, to get us to the rock, to get us to the foundation, sometimes he uses people to turn those shovels. Just a week or two ago, uh, Mike Rowe and I put some six by six posts out there. And I can tell you, his post hole digger, there were times when we stuck it down in there and I got two ounces of dirt. And then there were times when it went sliced right through this soft clay and you get these big old clumps. That soft stuff has to go. And when God is getting that soft stuff out of your life to get down to the hard, the, the rock, the, the firm foundation, when he's in the process of digging that out, he often uses people to dig it. I think we believe just going to church every week and listening to sermons is going to get all that soft junk out of the way and get us to the foundation of Christ so we can start building. But the reason we're still in infancy, the reason we haven't started building like we should be, the reason we're still observing like children and not participating like grown-ups is because we haven't let God dig the stuff out because we haven't let his people get involved. That's accountability. To get to the foundation, people have to help dig the junk out of the way. You need to let people dig in your life. Now, you need to be careful who you allow to dig in your life, but people have to turn those shovels. Find trustworthy people to help get that soft junk out of the way, to get you to the firm foundation. And then the follow-up to that is the good side of it. We need each other because we all have good and equally important gifts that we bring to the table. I have a friend who's a professor 
at a Christian college, and he did an experiment. He's an older man now, but he did an experiment years ago when he was teaching on unity in the church. The same junk Paul's upset about here, it still happens. I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. Get over yourselves. You all follow Jesus. You gotta work together and get the job done. That same stuff still happens. So he, he was teaching young ministers about the importance of cooperation in the church, of people using all their different gifts together at once in unity. And he said, to prove this, I'm gonna make a chicken sandwich all by myself. And you might think that doesn't sound all that daunting. Some of you make chicken sandwiches at home. And we're talking about like a fried chicken sandwich. And so you think you go buy chicken breast, batter it, fry it, buy a bun, put it on a bun, get some mayonnaise, some cheese, whatever. But he meant from scratch. So in his garden, he planted wheat that he would harvest and use to make flour to make a bun. And he bought chickens. I may be wrong about some of these details. I'm trying to remember. He bought chickens in a coop. He bought a cow, a dairy cow, Jersey cow that he could milk and use for dairy to make mayonnaise and and butter for the bun and cheese to put on the chicken, all that good stuff. He, of course, had some friends help him with knowing how to do all of this, but, but he did it himself. And by the end of the process, in order to have a chicken sandwich on his table, it took almost a year and $600 for a chicken sandwich because he wanted to show what it would take to make that by himself. And yet many of us could drive to Huntington, not today because they're closed, but tomorrow, drive to Huntington, go right through Chick-fil-A's drive through And even though there's 48 cars in line, it'll only take you five minutes. And you get this beautiful chicken sandwich. And it'll cost you like four bucks. Four dollars, what by yourself could cost you a year and 600 bucks of, of your time and effort and money, cost you four or five bucks at a drive through that takes five minutes. How is that possible? Because of teamwork. Because there are so many people involved in making that sandwich that you eat that you have no idea. I mean, you have no idea how many people are involved in harvesting all the stuff, processing all the stuff, making all the stuff. I mean, this guy didn't actually do every single bit of it from scratch. He had to cheat and cut corners, and even still, it took that long and that much money. The point is obvious. Anything you try to do by yourself, you're not gonna do it as well or efficiently or as beautifully as when you do it as a team. How much more is that true in the body of Christ and the church? And this analogy could go pretty far if you allow it, but, but let's just suffice to say, you all have a job to do. And if we're not all doing our jobs, then it's gonna take the rest of us longer and it's not gonna be as efficient or as beautiful when we're done. But if everybody steps up to the plate, if everybody works and participates, instead of just observing from the background, if you all do your part, find a place to serve and get involved, then I think we could build something very beautiful for God. And I think we could build it pretty quickly. I think we could start to see progress right away. And so our our goal, our vision over the next year is for you to all participate and for no one else to sit back and observe, for all of us to understand that our work matters, that it's worth it, that our work will be evaluated and judged, and ultimately that it's work we have to do together. Would you stand with me as we close? I told you about that paper, the first C that I can remember ever receiving. I brought my grade down to like a B plus for the whole course, which is the only B I ever got in grad school. Very frustrating. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. It made me mad, but I needed that lesson because he said something to me, and I don't know if he said it verbatim, but he taught me something that's, that is so valuable, I'll never forget it. He taught me that my work really does matter. Because for years of my life, I went to school and did the assignments, and I did often what I knew I had to do to get a good grade, but I never cared. I never really cared about any of that. I just wanted to to finish and do well and get a good job. I don't know that I thought anybody else cared, and that's why I didn't care that much. Nobody really cares. You teachers in the room know that you do care, but I didn't believe that when I was a kid. I was like, nobody cares. They just see a paper, they grade it, and they go on about their business. He helped me see something as a grown adult that I should have known my whole life. My work does matter, and it affects people around me. Your work matters. It matters. It's valuable. You are God's temple, and it's your job to help build it and make it beautiful. And God will evaluate it, and you will be rewarded if you work hard and do what is right. And if not, you will suffer loss, but you need not fear, because in Christ we do have security. He is our hope. He is our salvation. This morning, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, 
during this last song, I'll wait up here and I would love to talk to you about that. But I know many of you already have a relationship with Jesus. So my challenge, my encouragement to the rest of you is that when you leave this place today, you are a, you are a catalyst for change in the church. Even if other people don't take this to heart, even if they don't put in the work, even if they do nothing differently, you be the difference. You do something. You find a place to serve. You step out in faith. Let people start digging that soft junk out of your life and find more opportunities to do kingdom work. That happens in conversations every day. It happens here in the local church. It happens in community service. It happens in sharing your testimony with other people and just being a kind and decent person who represents Christ to the rest of the world. In all of these ways and many others, you can do the work of God, but you've got to choose to do it. And so I challenge you to get to work. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word, and thank you for the Holy Spirit that propels us into action. May you move in mighty ways among your people today. May we go out fueled and ready to do good for your kingdom and for your glory. We ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen.